Have you ever expected something to be bad, and then ended up disappointed anyway because it was just so much worse than you could have possibly imagined? Sponge on the Run was a film that never filled many people with confidence. All of the hype and the advertisement left many people with the assumption that this movie was just going to be a cheap cash-in, and an attempt to promote Camp Coral. It is both of those things, but to be fair, it's a whole lot more. At the same time, it's a whole lot less. If I could sum up this film in one word, it would be incompetent. This is one of the most incompetent animated films that I have ever seen. The story is non-existent. The characters are continually out of character. No one has any motivation for anything they do. Somehow, paradoxically, this movie rehashes so much from previous Spongebob episodes of movies, and at the same time, it completely misunderstands the Spongebob universe. And me saying that right out of the gate is probably a red flag for a lot of people. I mean, how do you misunderstand the Spongebob universe? It's a show that only rarely has continuity, and even a casual viewer could tell you about 20 times when one episode contradicted another. I mean, it's totally clear that the catalyst of this movie is that snails are endangered. You know, snails. Spongebob's stand in for cats. You know, we've had episodes about a race for snails, an episode about a pet show for snails. We have a pet food that is name dropped within the movie for snails specifically. And the entire movie is built on the fact that snails are basically an endangered species. I, I don't know how you do this. I don't know how you watch the show and come up with the idea that these snails are probably hard to find. You might think that I'm joking or looking too deeply into things, but no, I I'm serious. The main plot of this movie is started when King Poseidon, who is in no way similar to King Neptune from the first movie, is so vain that he uses Snail Trail to moisturize himself. But because he does this so much, snails are noted to be, in the movie's words, depleted. In fact, the entire snail population has been, uh... What's the word? Oh yeah, depleted. So Plankton steals Gary the Snail and gives him to the king, because there are no other snails anywhere in the world except in King Poseidon's dungeon and in Spongebob's house. And King Poseidon puts all the snails in his dungeon after he's finished using them because snail labor is really the most efficient thing an absolute monarch can find. The premise of this movie has surprised just about everyone I told it to, and like, this really is a thing. SpongeBob as a show usually demands a lot of suspension of disbelief. It's highly cartoony and expects the audience to just accept things. And it's usually able to get that. Even on a lot of the bad SpongeBob episodes, the premises still make sense within its universe. So it has to be an extra special fuck up to come up with a premise that doesn't make sense in this universe to even a casual viewer. Even ignoring the big problem, they screw up a lot of the other little details too. Everything is gonna be cool. Clams have been birds, sharks, and circus animals, uh, but any fan of Spongebob knows that worms are their versions of dogs. Once again, as has been seen in several episodes. The movie wants you to know right from the start that this really isn't Spongebob, but a poor imitation of Spongebob. The tempered, pristine, shallow seas of the tropics. That's not the French narrator. The place of unparalleled beauty and fecundity. You know, the one who is usually played by Tom Kenny, the voice actor who plays the main character of the movie, who is obviously available for a role that is usually done by the French narrator. It's the first thing in the movie, too. And the second thing is an extended sequence of Patrick and Spongebob being annoying, which is probably for the best. It's good foreshadowing of what's to come. And here's the thing. I'm allowed to complain about all these little continuity errors and misunderstandings of Spongebob because it's clear that the people behind the show are intimately familiar with the series. After all, the plot of this movie is exactly the same as the first movie. Plankton wants to get the Krabby Patty formula, because that is the only thing we can make a Spongebob movie plot about apparently. So he has a plan that involves theft to get the Krusty crew out of the way, by taking advantage of a king of the sea who is a merman. Said king's biggest flaw is his vanity. This one's biggest concern is wrinkles, but we do learn that he is... Are you suggesting that I don't need this gorgeous mane of wavy locks? You know how that's a clip from the first movie, right? And it works perfectly in context for the third movie. You know how that's a problem, right? This movie is technically a road trip movie, although to be fair on that one, every single movie based on a cartoon is also a road trip movie. Patrick and Spongebob must go on some long quest to get back a stolen, um, object. Along the way, they meet a celebrity guide that's there to be a random gag. I don't have the courage. <laughs> oh, I love this part. This is the part where Mandy comes in and gives them their mustaches and they sing that Now That We're Men song. What? What do you mean that's only in the first movie? I thought I was watching the first movie. 
this is the one with the burger car in it. Oh wait, both of these movies have a burger car. Why do both of these movies have a burger car? You can't say fan service and have the plot being how snails are so endangered that apparently Spongebob is one of the last people in the world to have one of them. Because as a Spongebob fan, I remember the episode Have You Seen the Snail, which showcased quite a few lost snails, and also had an old woman who was implied to find enough of them to eat. And I remember Have You Seen the Snail because this movie also rips that off. Yeah, Spongebob, we, we gotta find Gary uh, again because that's never been done before. Honestly though, I wouldn't mind that much if this movie was just the search for Gary. What I hate the most about this setup is that it's the third movie that involves the secret formula going missing. The first time, I get it. It's the big movie and that's the most common and famous Spongebob plot. The second movie had a nice twist on it so I can let that slide. But by the third time you make a movie about Plankton stealing the Krabby Patty formula, no, I want out. Do something new. Doing something new isn't out of Spongebob's capabilities. A lot of people don't like the 22 minute specials and I can understand that, but I do want to give them credit for this. Very few of them fall into this overcooked recipe. In them, Spongebob was a cowboy. He went to some other city and became the mayor. There was a special about a train robbery. He went back to medieval times. We learned the backstory of Plankton and Krabs. And if that's too much work to make a big high stakes plot out of, you could just take the Spongebob musical and animate that. Fucking hell, if that's all you did, people would probably be praising this to high heavens. Even a lot of the 11 or 7 minute episodes have some interesting concepts that could be made bigger with having to go to the dry milk cow of how does Plankton steal the formula today? The movie was talked about as if it was inspired by It's a Wonderful Life. Personally, I thought that it meant Spongebob might go to another universe where he never existed, which would have been really interesting, you know, if it wasn't also a rehash of the first movie. Because learning about what would happen in Bikini Bottom without Spongebob, that happened in the first movie. You remember? Because Spongebob wasn't there to stop Plankton, he was able to conquer everything. Y you guys did see the first movie, right? I mean, you must have seen the first movie, because the burger car. This movie is stale leftovers that should have been incinerated as soon as it was found. And that goes for the jokes, too. Skill Crane jokes. How original. Self-driving boat! And you use that joke in your episode about the self-driving car. A couple of the episodes this movie rips off are so recent that they were probably in production at the same time as the movie. Any original jokes in this film are either gross or half-baked. Plankton's ass is animated in one scene for no reason. And in another scene we see Patrick eat the contents of a litter box that we were shown was full just a couple minutes earlier. And I have to ask, because I, I just have to know at this point, what is with the insistence of these modern kids films to remind people that everyone poops? We can't make it through an animated movie in the 2020s without putting shit somewhere in the film. It's the fucking law. We have all this technology now and all these talented people, we absolutely have to show people what feces looks like in animation. I will give credit where it's due though. This movie somehow got closer to Pleasure Island than Pinocchio ever did. Execution of the suspects? What happened to Habeas Swordfish? Y you really couldn't find an underwater rhyme for corpus. L like porpoise. Was this film written in one go? Cause that's what it feels like. Speaking of feces, this film has two flavors of shit. There's a lack of polish in the moment to moment. Early in the movie, Plankton breaks into the Krusty Krab to get the formula. Spongebob throws him into the fryer by accident, and then Spongebob leaves, Plankton alone, in the Krusty Krab, with no one else coming back until the morning. It is after all of this that Plankton decides now is the time that Spongebob must go, instead of just taking the formula that he just stole, because he is still in the premises. Squidward does exactly what Spongebob told him to do in order to get the grill working, but it doesn't work. Usually this only happens because Squidward doesn't listen to Spongebob. King Neptune, I mean Poseidon, I mean I don't give a fuck, offers a boon for giving a snail to him. This is never mentioned afterwards and not something Plankton ever takes. He gets absolutely no reward for giving Spongebob's snail to the king. And then there's the big stuff that's wrong with this movie. The characters just aren't right. Feels more to me like the journey of a singular hero who, against all odds, triumphs over adversity. Does this sound like Spongebob? From anywhere. Then he goes on to have a fight with Patrick that lasts literally a minute and goes nowhere. I only think that this is here because it's a law that the two best friend characters must have a fight that gets resolved quickly in every kids movie ever. Oh wait, there is no law here. This was completely pointless. Sandy is a little uncanny as well, but crabs and plankton are the worst here. So after Spongebob goes missing, the Krusty Krab has one day of chaos, as far as I can tell anyway. And then crabs just sits there, depressed, missing Spongebob. Krabs hasn't gone anywhere to look for Spongebob. As far as I know, Krabs hasn't even gone to Spongebob's house. It's like, what do you want from me? I tried nothing and I'm all out of ideas. But somehow, without Spongebob, 
This whole thing just doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> Plankton, however, is even worse. In the first movie, he completely took over and there was a lot of chaos. In this movie, Plankton just gives up. We never even see him selling Krabby Patties. He just gets the formula because Krabs gives it to him because he can't be bothered to look for Spongebob. And then, randomly, Plankton has a change of heart, comes back, and says that he stole Gary to get Spongebob out of the way. It's like no one in this movie has any motivation for any single thing that they do. Sure, Spongebob had a reason to go to Shell City, I mean Atlantic City, but riddle me this. Why didn't he tell Krabs where he was going? Why didn't he at least tell Squidward, someone he sees as a friend? Spongebob just decides to pick up and leave. This film is so sloppy. You know how this movie is called Sponge on the Run? Do you know why it's called Sponge on the Run? At an hour and 12 minutes, Spongebob decides to run from the law. And then 3 minutes and 40 seconds, exactly, yes I timed it, he gets captured. That is enough to call this movie Sponge on the Run. Seriously, the title of this movie comes from a 3 minute segment at the end of it. It'd make more sense to call this movie Dancing Cowboy Pirate Zombies featuring Snoop Dogg. No, I'm not kidding. You better leave now where you lost, dog. The zombie king. This is literally a part of the movie. It makes just as much sense in context as I'm showing it to you now. This is where they meet Keanu Reeves, who is the tumbleweed. And he gives them a coin to help them defeat Machete, who is a devil with laser eyes that melts in the sunlight like a vampire. Which is not something that devils do. It's also apparently a dream, but the coin that they got in the dream is actually a real coin even though they lose it later and it has nothing to do with the plot. It's like someone saw the mermaid mustaches from the first movie and decided to intentionally miss the point completely. I've been ranting for a while, but I, I think I'm forgetting something. <laughs> oh yeah, the entire reason that this movie exists, Camp Coral. So, the Camp Coral segments are probably less integrated into this movie than the dancing cowboy pirate zombies. Remember that episode of Fairly Odd Parents where people were randomly mentioning summer camp and, and then there was an echo as if a flashback was about to start? Imagine that, except we do get a prolonged flashback. And then you have the camp coral aspects to this film. If these segments were quick, this might actually legitimately work as a running gag because they come right the fuck out of nowhere. And they'll be going on about what happened at summer camp like it has anything to do with what's going on. The first time after Gary gets kidnapped, it's Spongebob remembering meeting him at summer camp. I will say though, it was an interesting artistic choice to record the audio for this segment underwater. Quite daring, I must say. Then all the rest of the segments happen at the end, when Spongebob and his friends are defending him against being executed. Oh yeah, there are public executions in the Spongebob universe now. It's apparently a high class dinner show, and they're so well supported that even someone as famous as Kelpie G headlines them by doing a jazz cover of My Heart Will Go On. So while Spongebob is on his death trial for stealing something from the king, all of his friends are just going on about this nice thing that Spongebob once did for them at summer camp when he was a kid during a trial for his execution about theft. And this is all said like we're supposed to take it seriously, at the very least it's not a joke. This is supposed to be like the heartfelt climax of the film. Like, the king is supposed to take this seriously. The audience is supposed to take this seriously. Fucking hell. If you wanted to advertise Camp Coral this badly, why is this movie about finding Gary and the Krabby Patty formula in fucking New Jersey? Just have Spongebob be a camp counselor at his childhood summer camp. Ding ding ding, everyone's a winner! You get to have your advertisement, the movie makes fucking sense, and I can see bootleg Spongebob torn apart by Jason. The Camp Coral segments are so poorly integrated and thought out that it really is tragic. I mean, let's start out with a thing that everyone brings up. They break continuity completely. Spongebob did not meet Sandy at summer camp, but when she was an adult. And I know that Spongebob doesn't really care about continuity, but it was the first fucking episode! It's like saying that Spongebob works at the Chum Bucket, or that his best friend is Larry the Lobster. It's not one of those up in the air or back and forth things, like Spongebob's perfect attendance records. It is a part of the foundation of the entire show. And because these segments are so poorly thought out, they have some, let's call them implications. So back in Camp Coral, Squidward's clarinet playing was terrible, so he didn't get a talent show award that he thought he deserved. So Spongebob decided to be nice and lie and say that he actually won and he gives him the trophy. This sounds really nice and heartwarming, until you remember that Squidward is STILL a terrible clarinet player that makes everyone miserable with his music and is STILL in denial about it. It's weird, I didn't expect the message of this film, of all things, to be that participation trophies are bad. 
I say this is all poorly thought out, but it's clear that there were no thoughts of any kind here. The credits of this movie end with an in memory of Steven Hillenburg, which is always awkward when the product ends up being so bad. Actually, no, it'd be awkward just if the product was bad, but it's worse than that. This film has such a significant misunderstanding of what Steven Hillenburg created. I'm not even just talking about the continuity, it's the heart and soul of it. This film is the first movie again without any of the heart and soul or any of the special ingredients that made it fun. The first movie had random bits of gross out and it definitely had random humor, but it was really well crafted enough that it all gelled together nicely. This film just grasps at bits and pieces of what came before, thinking it could be even a quarter as good, but this film is far less than the sum of its parts. I expected this movie to make me angry, but no, it just makes me sad. It's a sad attempt to cash in on what came before, and resulted in nothing other than a pale imitation that leaves nothing of value. Because any positive qualities that this film might have had were stolen wholesale from much better works. This movie is just awful in the worst way, and if you have any temptations at all to see it, just watch the first movie and then watch Have You Seen the Snail. There, you've done it!